are going to introduce our moderators and special guests for the evening. Uh, we, how it's going to work tonight is uh, we're going to view this play for about an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, then we will take uh, a short break uh, and about five minutes. And then when we come back, we'll have our guests. So tonight I'm going to bring our moderators for the evening, which who are uh, Kelly Vinyl, who is a PhD, but also public events coordinator for science ATL, who is organized these wonderful uh, panelists for us, and Nicole Palmietto, who is our National New Play Network producer in residence at Horizon Theater, and she's been organizing this partnership with Science ATL. So come on down, ladies, and introduce yourself. Hello, um, I am Nicole Palmietto, NNPN producer in residence here. Thrilled to be working um, with Horizon and so happy to have connected with Science ATL for this program. Um, I'd love to introduce you to Kelly Vinyl, who has found all of our wonderful special guests, um, scientists working in our actual community. So Kelly, if you would like to come up and introduce yourself. Sure, hi, I'm Kelly. Um, yeah, this has been a super exciting thing uh, to partner on. It's really fun when art and science collides in any ways, and it's you know super exciting to talk about it. And you should know because you run Science Collider, right? Science Collider or Story Collider? Oh, Story, story Collider. Collider. Mm. Yeah, I'm part of Story Collider. Story yeah. Collider, which is science stories, right? Mm -hmm. True personal stories about science. Cool. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, next we'd like to introduce you to um, our special guest for tonight, Dr. Carlene. Uh, so I didn't actually ask you how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> um, so if you would like to come up and tell us a little bit about your work. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my name is Carlene. Um, I'm a molecular bi biologist at Vanderbilt. I study gen rare genetic diseases. Um, I actually just finished watching the show, which I'm glad I did because I kind of have a 3D relationship with it. Um, I'm a scientist. I've dated other scientists. Um, I actually have used both of the techniques that you'll see uh, soon in the show, and I can talk more about it afterwards, but I've done genetic screening. So basically, when you look at multiple genes that are involved in the system um, and kind of screwing around with them to find out what they actually do, um, and then also studying protein-protein interactions, so one part of the cell interacting with another part of the cell. Um, I'm also uh, kind of in this arena because I've also been involved with science communication um, and also developing kind of mediums like this. We did a traveling show um, that was both a scientific lecture series, um, a abstract dance performance, and an art gallery show all about memory um, and that interface with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I'm really stoked to be here with everyone and to hear your thoughts and to kind of share what I've learned along the way. And I love that you're, you're a visual artist yourself and also you're playing the ukulele. I love that in your bio. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're no stranger to the art and science um, collaborate, collaboration, um, which we love. Um, and our second special guest tonight is Dr. Eric Shen. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a research scientist at Georgia Tech. Uh, I work on color changing coatings and you've seen this maybe on your rear view mirror in a car where it gets a little bit darker when a light shines behind you or when you have windows that can tint when it gets really, really bright and then they can untint when it gets uh, shadier. And a lot of those go from a dark color to a colorless uh, state. And we work more on just all the different colors, pinks, blues, purples, yellows, that kind of stuff. So really different from what you're going to see in the, in the play today. But looking forward to talking more about it later. Um, so uh, we are thrilled to have uh, our guest with us, and I'm going to have Kelly and Nicole take over from here. So you're on, you go. If you have a question, you can just shout it out. You can unmute yourself and just talk, uh, or you can put something in the chat, whichever one you like. Uh, we're being pretty informal here. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Again, I am Nicole. I'm one of your moderators tonight, and I'm on the staff here at Horizon Theater. And Kelly is our mm -hmm. other moderator. Hi, I'm Kelly Vinyl. Um, I work for Science ATL doing public events or you know online events. Um, and I also dabble in storytelling. Um, so if you ever are looking for a podcast to listen to or a live show, if we can meet again in person ever, um, check out Story Collider. Um, yeah. And Stories how would they science. do that, Kelly? 
Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Um, you can go to storyclider.org and that's where you can find uh, podcast updates, show updates, all that kind of stuff. Yay. Would you, would you drop that in the chat for everyone? Oh, so that that's a great can, idea. Uh, that they can go and check that out afterwards. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so our uh, guests tonight um, are Carlene and Eric, and we're gonna call them up um, here and have them chat with you. And um, remember that you can drop your questions in the chat at any time, and we'll be keeping track of that. Um, so our, our local scientists here to comment on the play that we all just saw um, and chat and, um, I would love to get us started by just asking um, Carlene, Carlene and Eric, um, whichever one of you wants to go first, um, just how did you get into your fields? Um, what led you uh, to, to study and to keep with it for um, your professions? And um, was it like the characters in the play? Did it have something to do with your parents? Sure, Carlene, do you want to go first or do you want me to take this one? I'll let you take over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think like uh, probably a lot of people, I sort of fell into this. Uh, I, I started in a very different path. I, I was, when I was young, I was interested in dinosaurs and that has nothing to do with color changing plastics that I'm doing now. But I guess I've always been interested in science. And so you bounce around from one lab to another until you, you find something that just, just really sticks um, and, and grabs your interest and then you go with it for quite a while. I, I, I don't think that's a too uncommon. Oh gosh, my cat. Hi. Sorry. Surprise kitty. Oh, that's yeah. the best. <laughs> that's very true. I will say, since you asked specifically about parents, I think I, I very consciously went in a very different direction from my parents. My parents were math uh, people and my dad is a theoretical mathematician, which means he works on stuff that uh, in his case at least has uh, as far as I know, no bearings on the real world. And I always thought that was a very bizarre sort of a world to live in. I, I live in a world of, of grants, like they talk about in the, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the play and, and tangible, very real results, like mirrors and windows and things like that. And <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine not doing, my dad literally needs no funding to sit in his chair and with a sheet of paper and a pencil, now, like he does now in his retirement. Uh, <laughs> the opposite opposite side of, of, of science. Uh, so that's that's sort of in a nutshell. Were there any other specific questions you had asked? Um, no, just, yeah, uh, if you wanna share a little bit about um, your actual uh, work that you are working on right now, you can do that oh, here yeah. as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say this really briefly and then uh, move it along to Carlene and, and just that in, in terms of the kind of stuff we do nowadays. Um, I don't remember if I said it initially, but I mean, you know, a lot of different colors uh, and like I was just saying applications out the wazoo from from buildings, but even to like toys to greeting cards, anything that you could just want to change colors is is fair game. And I think that's just it's, it's so much fun. I, I think it's it's a very tangible sort of uh, you know, science is fun kind of an example. Uh, sometimes science can seem very technical, but this is definitely me still being that kid that likes dinosaurs, but now I just really enjoy colors and trying to apply <laughs> this to, we, you know, and we do, you know, I got sent, I got sent a, uh, an, an action figure recently to think about how to make it actually change color. So stuff like that is, is very real and still allows me to just be a kid. Oh, that's, that's awesome. fun. Have you made a color changing dinosaur yet? <laughs> I have, I, I have almost forgotten about trying to blend dinosaurs with what I do, but that is going to be high on my list now that you mentioned that thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What about you, Carlene? Yeah, I guess I think for a lot of people, regardless of whatever field you're in, when you're a kid, like everyone's curious, right? When I was five, I was really lucky. My dad built me a tree house. So I was, you know, drawing on banana leaves as script and catching bugs and all sorts of stuff growing up. But it wasn't my curiosity that catapulted me into science. It was my great desire to get away from my parents and my brothers. <laughs> There's an opportunity to go to science camp. So I went to science camp when I was seven and I continued to go to the same science camp up until I was about um, years in, into high school. 
Um, and then actually in high school, I was like, I know I'm going to study biology. So I majored in art when I was in high, um, high school because I was like, you know what? If I want to be a scientist, I need money and I need a college degree. <laughs> but if I gain some like basic art skills now as a high school student, I'll be able to pick it up whenever when I'm older. So I actually focused on art um, initially. I went to college, studied biology. Um, and kind of out of just like random, like I emailed a bunch of people, I was like, please take me in your lab out of like sheer chance. I ended up in a lab very similar to the lab that they talk about in the group um, where they were studying different mutations. So instead of yeast, you would take like a hundred flies of one type of genetic abnormality and you would force them to mate with another hundred flies of a different genetic abnormality. And the thing about it is, is that like biological systems, they're very robust, right? Like you can screw them up and they'll be like, whatever, I've got other ways to do this. But if you have two different mutations and you crossbreed them, you're gonna break something. So that's how we would find out like gene A and gene B do, gene, do whatever function because now the fruit fly wings are all crumpled up. Um, and working with fruit flies was awesome because as many other scientists hate this, people who study fruit flies basically determine the name for all genes. So you get really screwed up gene names like Sonic the Hedgehog, um, <laughs> or, and it's all based off of like how the flies look or how they behave. So there are certain genetic mutations. They have these flies that are called bar flies because they have a really high alcohol tolerance. <laughs> Other is called cheap date, which is like kind of not PC, um, she date because they have a really low alcohol tolerance. So really it's the fly biologists who get to screw with everyone else. So that was really fun. So I did that as an undergrad. Um, and despite the fact that it was my family that kind of repelled me towards science camp, um, my mom was a nurse, my dad was a respiratory therapist. And so when I went to finishing up college, I was like, you know, flies are cool, but I kind of want to help people. I like didn't fully understand how basic research could help people yet. So I was like, I'm gonna go to grad school for biomedical research. I wanna explicitly work on people. Um, and the program I went to was just like an umbrella program. So you didn't know what you were gonna study. You just go in and you just know like something medically related. So when I started grad school, I actually worked in a bunch of different programs. I studied breast cancer. I studied stem cells. Um, I studied glioblastoma. But the core component of all these programs was drug development. So I knew I wanted to develop new therapeutics. Um, and I also knew that this new field that was growing was just called personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea that you can walk into the hospital, they'll take a sample from you. And instead of being like, you have breast cancer, we have, gene, we have medications X, Y, Z for you. It's you have a very specific type of breast cancer that causes you know, this type of weird malformation of your cells because of X, Y, Z, we're gonna use your genetics to find out what the best treatment for you is. Because the thing is, when it comes to developing medications for patients, you know, you might have breast cancer, but the type of genetic change that you have might've been studied in prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So based off the FDA, the FDA might say like, no, 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 this drug is only for prostate cancer. But now with personalized medicine, you get a further like, greater understanding for this might be in a different part of your body but the cells are doing the same type of abnormal behavior so that's kind of what propelled me towards my research is now i'm continuously interested in how do you take a single person and make sure that you have a drug that appeals to their genetic background um, and so that's kind of where in the show they talk about interactions so i send the interact domics so in her yeast work, she takes gene A, gene B, and sees how they interact. Interactomics is a lot like genomics, which is people talk about all the time, right? You're not studying one gene, you're studying all the genes. So in our work, we don't just study gene A and gene B, it's like the, the traveling salesman problem, right? Gene A interacts with B, C, D, E, F, G, H, Y, Z. But in her work, um, he talks about the traveling salesman's problem the thing that's different between her work and his work is that in her work, it's on, off, on, off. His work, the, the TSP problem is a sequence. A causes B, causes C, causes D. And normally when you do experiments, you just have 1990. What happened in 1990? You don't have the history of 1985 and 2010. 
you only have a snapshot or you have all of those years mixed together, but you don't know when they happened. What our lab is trying to do is we want that history. We want that lineage. It's a lot like dating people, right? Think about, you know, the three or ever, how many people you dated. Imagine if you dated them out of order, right? Your relationships would be completely different. So when it comes to what we're trying to do is not only did XYZ happen to you, what order did it happen to you? Uh -huh. So that's the gist of what my current research is, except on a, a cellular level. And how does that influence how well you respond to a certain drug? That sounds, sounds like a big field. <laughs> um, it, the thing about research is that it gets more and more specific. And then you realize that there's only like 10 of you who care. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Let's see, I'm wondering if anything stuck out for either of you, like something that really resonated or something that like made you want to throw your computer out the window. <laughs> what people mentioned in the comments about the mouse work. Uh, <laughs> right? yeah, animals, animals are really expensive. Um, so this idea that you could go from a single cell organism like a yeast to a mice. I mean, you're talking about the like big <laughs> on the dollar to like thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, I think for me, I was like, oh, like realistically, you would probably move from like yeast to like a cell model system. So like primary cells are cells from like a person. A cell model system would be like something that's immortal that grows in the lab forever. So AKA hard for a grad student to mess up. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Mostly. Something that you can, yeah, something that you can genetically edit in the lab that's not costly. So that was like probably the first thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and never thought of brought up costly. Uh, Sorry. Uh, one of our previous guests also brought up that uh, the ethics of dealing with mice that like you have to treat them well too. <laughs> and you, this would sort of, that would violate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You can't just go around borrowing mice. That's not how it works. <laughs> um, yeah, what about you, Eric? Did anything come up in particular? Yeah, not working in that area, I, that didn't strike me at all. But then when I saw the comments, it made perfect sense. And I was, <laughs> I was thinking that, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's got to be the way it works. I, I think for me, what the, the first moment that really grabbed me in the play was when we were learning about the fingers that regrow. Uh, that was a really neat thing that I've never heard of before. And I, I, I think the, the, the places where they, you know, the play draws analogies and it just integrates the way that uh, you know you use your research and you talk about it in analogous ways to what's happening in your real life is something that really happens mm. for us on a regular basis. And I thought that was a particularly elegant uh, opportunity where they they did a good job. That and of course the traveling salesmen were, were both well taught uh, examples that really I think for many people taught them something brand new that they didn't know prior to watching this play. Um, and also helped you see the connections. And it made me think about a lot of the, the kind of similar, you know, things that we'll, we'll say in, in our everyday lives. And I, I was thinking about why we do this uh, and, and whether it's, it's, it's goofy or geeky or not. But I mean, on the one hand is what we think about all the time. And on the other hand, I think we try to explain things we don't fully understand by drawing analogies from stuff mm -hmm. that is happening in our everyday life. So I think the connection sort of starts forming both ways. So I think that 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 to me is what, what I, I really took away from this, from watching the play. That's a really interesting point. I love that. I really like thinking about that. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. Somebody we have, um, we have yeah. a, our first chat question. Ooh. <clears throat> and um, it's for Eric. Um, it's actually from um, our, our Amy, our, um, uh, digital content manager and Zoom master and video editor extraordinaire. Um, she says, Eric, is the work you do classified as materials science? Do you work in the MSC department at tech? Right. This goes back, I think it was Franklin that talked about sort of this new way where all the different fields are sort of integrated. I, I, I'm definitely a part of a very integrated field where I'm a chemist. <laughs> I got my training pouring things into a, you know, a vial, mixing them together and, and so on, exactly what you would think a chemist would do. 
and, and making plastics. You know, if you've ever done like the nylon, uh, making nylon tests, right? You, you just got these batches of two things. You kind of swirl it around and, and right where those two things begin to mix together, you can kind of pull this long string of nylon out of the, the bath. That's a pretty popular kind of uh, grade school level experiment that gets done a lot. So those are the kind of things I've done, but you know, we have to work with physicists to think about how light interacts with our materials. And we have to work a lot with material scientists to think about all the different, uh, you know, things that we can uh, coat our materials onto. So we're at the intersection of a lot of different things. And I think our field has for a long time required the expertise of, of physicists, material science, chemists, I'm probably forgetting a few others, a lot of computational theoretical work as well. Um, so it's been very interdisciplinary. It's been very fun to, it's, it's, you're very much meeting different people, people from other departments, people from around the world. Um, and I think that adds to sort of the, the funness of, of a lot of what I do. So I'm, I'm a chemist, not a material science scientist uh, to answer the question, but we, we are certainly at the intersection of all of these different fields. My, uh, my brother just graduated from Georgia Tech with his undergrad in material science and he wants to work with plastics. And so like my understanding of that is very, very limited. Um, and so I'll understand like things as he describes them in like a really baseline way, but also to like have you say that you are working with like a ton of different groups of people in all different areas of science to actually like create a physical item. And then it's not like just material science, but also like chemists and physicists and whatever this kind of gives me a better understanding of like what the world he might be entering into looks like because yeah. I have no idea what it means <laughs> like it's a lot of conversation yeah. it's a lot of starting to understand something from this direction and then someone telling you well you can't really do that and then you try to come from a slightly different direction you <laughs> probably can do that and then slowly you start to form these 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 bonds and these connections between one another where you're talking the same language it takes a long long time to to, to ask a physicist to not talk like a physicist or a chemist to not talk like a chemist, but slowly you get there and you start to understand the uh, the importance of trying to, to talk in, in, in those more general terms. I think that's amazing because I think there's so many scientists that get stuck in their little cave and they have all their friends from their cave and they're just talking, you know, they, they forget what reality is. And I just think there's so much value in coming at these things from so many different angles and that uncomfortable space of like trying to feel each other out. Um, so I, I just I think what you do is really cool. Yeah, and I, I guess I don't really have the broad perspective of the development of education. I, my, my impression is that once upon a time, fields were not so interdisciplinary, but I don't really know enough historically to say uh, to what extent that's true and how much it's really shifted from them. But I, I, like you said, I can't imagine it being any other way now that I've been doing this my entire career, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's how the breakthroughs happen, you know, like someone comes up with like a terrible idea or a mistake happens, you know, like you have to be in that uncomfortable space, you know, that exploration space. I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Not hmm. scientist relationships, science, science, dating scientists. I know that, uh, Carly, you said you had some history of that. <laughs> yeah, I've dated two scientists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my uh, previous boyfriend, we did it for like five years. We worked in the same lab. Um, I was younger than him, and I was thinking about applying to grad school. He was going to pharmacy school. And so I, you know, I didn't really understand like drug development. I was like, drugs help people, that sounds cool. So like him going to grad school to be a pharmacist, I was like, wow, like that's so that's so very cool. <laughs> and then I went to grad school. So we were in grad school at the same time, which is a nightmare. Um, and it's one of those things where when you're in a pressure cooker, you overlook problems, right? Like grad school is so hard. The problems mm -hmm. that you're having with your partner is not because you don't match, it's because grad school, right? Right. <laughs> so like near the end, he finished grad school. I still had like a year and a half, two years left. So he finished grad school. So I was like, you're done. Like you have to be nicer to me now. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was the same. And I was like, you have zero excuses now. <laughs> we broke up. And then um, wow. my current boyfriend, um, he's also older than me. So he had already like been through the ringer. Um, he, by the time we started dating, he had gone through two postdocs. So he graduated from grad school. He did one postdoc where I am now and then another postdoc. Um, and 
our relationship has never been anchored in science. So that was the thing, like our previous relationship, one of the reasons why we ebbed and flowed so well is because as an undergrad, I didn't know any other scientists. So the fact that he could talk science to me was like so tantalizing. But mm. then you go to grad school and you're like, everyone's a scientist. Like there's nothing <laughs> special about being a scientist anymore. Wasn't um, sexy so, anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, everybody's smart. Like you're not gonna, like the fact that you understand what I'm doing is no longer impressive. Mm-hmm. Because that's the thing, when I was an undergrad, like no one understood what I was doing, right? And like trying to explain your research to someone sometimes can be really laborious. And what was funny now is that like as a grad student, a lot of people don't like talking about science because now it's a job, right? Mm. So my relationship with my current boyfriend, he does not like talking about science, which I think almost helps us out a little bit more. Mm. But, but yeah, dating among, I mean, I think it's probably the same in any other field where you're dating coworkers, but I feel like science <laughs> So much of your ego is tied to being a scientist that it gets really complicated. Yeah, it's interesting because I've seen it work. I have a couple of friends that worked in the same lab. They actually got married. Oh gosh! And they actually defended it the same day. I went to their double defense. It was very wow. cute. Um, yeah, it's great when it works. Massive yeah, when it doesn't work. exactly. But the, yeah, a lot of the time it doesn't work. Um, it, and I mean, I think personalities play into that, and just like past experiences. Like, you know, I didn't want to. I don't know, grad school is really stressful and like honestly kind of traumatic for me in, in some places. So just like, I don't want to talk about science. And, you know, I found a chemist, but he was a chemist with like a rat tail that rode bikes and ate burritos he found on the train. And I was like, yeah, that's what I like. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, grad school is a weird time. <laughs> I had two friends who they worked in the same lab and then they bought a house together and then they broke up. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, that's messy. Someone in the, uh, Margie's asking about relationships between mm. postgrads and advisors that were compromised with relationship issues. Any, any, is that any real life truth to that advisor? And if, if you've ever heard, does everyone know what CRISPR is? Yes. Yeah. Spicy. Yeah. yeah well, CRISPR. I'm Jennifer, not a hundred percent. Yeah. I'm a little fuzzy on, on the details. Yeah. So like that's what CRISPR is. Gene, gene editing. <laughs> Basically like, oh, if you can make your baby have all the superpowers you want, mm. kind of like the very flashy gene editing. I mean, we're not there obviously, but the idea is there. Jennifer Doudna, who's the scientist who established that she married her grad student who is really? the author on that work. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're doing okay. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I imagine though there's got to be it's just tricky I mean with rank no matter what I think there you know there's going to be issues but just thinking about like professors that have tenure you know I I don't know I can't I just feel like there's more stories that I probably don't know about but I feel like it can get it can get tricky yeah yeah I think I'd take a pretty hard line on this one and say it's it's inappropriate without any sort of caveats to that it's 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 there's a power dynamic issue at hand here that is insurmountable and so having said that, you know, as, as you know, Carlene just brought up, it, it totally happens. Uh, I definitely remember, my, you know, my, my professors when I was in college, there were plenty of examples of professors, you know, who had, had done this decades ago. And either because it was a different time then or because it worked out, uh, you know, I think, you know, people didn't really think twice about it in the same way. But if it, if it were something that broke light, you know, now, some, something in my department or something like that it would be yeah. it would it would go straight to the the chair and then it would have to go through very the thing laborious about, channels these sort of yeah go ahead sorry sorry my bad no i interrupted you i'm so sorry no, that, that was everything <laughs> the thing about it is it's like it's one thing to date your boss right probably a bad idea in general but mm-hmm. that relationship is not contingent upon you finishing a project like as yeah. a grass like so if you're a postdoc you have a contract and the contract's up you get to leave as a grad mm-hmm. student, you have to produce a certain amount of content in order to leave. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Enough so that, until you reach enough. <laughs> yeah, so like you're, it's so much worse. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I didn't actually know that until you just said that. So it's, it's not like, you know, to like get your MFA, like you go and it's a three-year program and, you know, you know, at the end you have to, um, you know, do a, um, a play that you 
write a thesis on it and all these things. But um, so, so is it not like three years for your, your grad school or it's just whenever yeah. you're done? <laughs> yeah, it's tricky because you're coming up with a research question and you're like, this is what I'm going to study. And then you study it and like science doesn't, is you know, you know, A, B, C, D, E, and F are true. So like, you're like, ah, I think F is true or Q is, you know, whatever. And it just never is. And it's just a lot of like grasping through the dark. You know what I mean? Like smart grasping through the dark. Um, I think part of it comes down to luck. I feel like sometimes like, you know, I made a huge mistake during uh, my dissertation work and I was just like, oh no. But then that mistake is like what led me to like wrapping up my dissertation work. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, maybe one of one of you guys can talk about your experience with that. My experience did not work until one of my rotation students made a mistake and it fixed it <laughs> after a year of me trying to fix it. Oh man, <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> hey, at oh, least it no. worked after that, right? Yeah. I think it uh, like yeah, depends, my... oh, go ahead. My, I don't think my experiments ever worked actually. And that's why I no longer mix chemicals and I, I do a slightly more material science-y thing. So I, I sort of, I think, banged my head against the wall for, for a period of time and the uh, reaction didn't want to work and there really isn't a whole lot you can do about it. Uh, the smart move would have been to just switch projects altogether, but it wasn't, I wasn't necessarily the, the smartest in that regard. So, no, so I banged you, my head on it for a while. You didn't want to give and, up, you know? <laughs> I, I yeah, that. yeah, that has its value and it also has its, uh, it, it punishes you in a certain way. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. The, the, you know, when the project's done, you're, you're done, but sometimes the project just doesn't want to be done. So it, it can take mm -hmm. a while. Yeah, I feel like for a lot of, I don't know, people always told me like, you'll spend all these years exploring and then like the last few months are like when it really all happens. And that yes. was also <laughs> true for me. Yeah. Just a lot of like mistakes. Um, but I was going to say that I think like whatever model system you're using can factor in as well, because one of my really good friends worked on tuberculosis and TB is a very slow growing bacteria. So like I would pop an E. coli like, you know, plate in overnight and just the next morning I'd have my results. She had to wait like a week every time, you know, like that, that prolongs the situation. So I think it, you know, and if you're using mice, you know, that's longer as well. Um, yeah, a lot of factors play into it. So um, I was told like, yeah, between, it'll take between five and seven-ish years, mm. you know, it just time. depends. And, but then there's that, like, there's like, some lucky people that maybe it takes them two years. Like they just got really lucky and they just, you know, you never know. Yeah. yeah. Margie's got a good question. She said, first, we had a question about Edomar. Uh, he wrote the play. There was a, just to answer someone's questions, there was a opportunity to get have a grant through the um, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for a science play. He said, but I never would have written it if I didn't have an idea first, because it's not worth taking the money just to write a play. Uh, but he uh, had this idea about paralleling relationships. And then he had to, he had the, he had heard about the um, the traveling salesman, he'd taken an engineering course in college and he always thought he wanted to do something with that. And he knew he needed to, he wanted to be a love relationship and then he had to go figure out what the other science was going to be. And he had went through a lot of different possible science ideas for that thing. And then he ended up kind of pairing those things together. So that's kind of where it, where it developed from. Um, but Margie is also asking, how are you all coping with a country that is rejecting science right now? Oh, heavy question. <laughs> That's a really good yeah. question. Yeah. I mean, I feel like all of us work at the intersection of like in some form of science communication and the intersection with, you know, trying to find more ways to make science more approachable and accessible. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's really hard. Do you guys have a better answer? I think everyone is trying to do what they can. And, you know, I, I, we had a lot of uh, meet, town hall meetings, a lot of you know, discussions uh, at, at our school to figure out, you know, how to, how to contribute. Um, as Kelly just said, I think for me, it, it's, it's outreach. Um, and uh, that's what I'm just most comfortable doing. And certainly at different levels, people have more ambitious goals to, to, to get the message out and to help educate the general public and yeah it, it looks like so many different things and i think it's all important because it all needs to get done and it's easy to get overwhelmed um you just got to sort of focus on what you've set your mind to and what you're good at and where you think you can make an impact and and just go from there i think 
Yeah. I, I think it can be really valuable to kind of share with people like how the process of science works, you know, because it's, you know, everyone's like, where's the vaccine? We need it yesterday and, and all these things. But I think if we can kind of like on this end of scientists, like communicate a little bit more about like, well, this is how the process works and this is why it's infuriating here. And like, you know, just getting more let into that process then it's, you know, a little more, yeah, I don't know, understandable. And you can kind of, um, you know, root along with scientists, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, and then the other thing that I found fascinating was the, the indictment that, you know, this scientist or this scientist was wrong about something. And then it struck me that honestly, scientists are, are wrong a lot. Mostly That's sort of, we're mostly wrong. We make a lot of hypotheses and then we're wrong, mm -hmm. but we have a mechanism to take that information where we were wrong, feed it back into itself to generate new hypotheses and constantly improve the model. Mm -hmm. And so somehow that there might be this general idea that scientists shouldn't be wrong is actually pretty damaging and one that I think we do need to work on a lot Yeah. to fix that, that misconception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. I love this mm. conversation so much because it, it it feels so resonant to me of what we're what we constantly deal with in the arts as well of like people get to see the product mm -hmm. they don't know all the work that went into creating that product or mm -hmm. just the actor or the designer or the director you know getting to a place in their craft where they could even make that product um, and you know and especially now um, with COVID, you know, theaters are closed. And so we're having to do things like this over Zoom that is completely different than what we were even trained for. Um, mm. And just, you know, what that looks like. And, and, you know, even when we are open, well, it takes four weeks of rehearsal to you get ready to put on a show and it takes mm -hmm. months and months of design before that. So it's so fascinating where we overlap in those ways. Mm. Yeah, I, I often think about like science and art, like they're just different sides, like it's all the same thing. It's just like from an, another angle in a lot of regards, I feel like. Yeah, I'm sort of surprised we haven't seen somebody come forward and say, just, I mean, maybe they have, and I just missed it, describe the process of making the vaccine. Like, like they have somebody on that says, these are the things we go through, this is how it's got to happen, you know, mm -hmm. or showing you like behind the, behind the scenes, you know. Yeah. So when well, Eric was talking about, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. No. So as Eric was talking about town halls, that's one of the things that we've been trying to do is just town halls on these are all the vaccines that are coming out. This is how they do clinical trials. This is the theoretical timeline. Um, but it's always like a weird space, right? Like I think a lot of people describe it as edutainment. Like mm -hmm. when you try to do outreach, like what percent of those people are paying attention because they're already scientifically educated. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but there's always the group of people in between who are like open-minded and they're looking for information, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you're completely right. There's not a lot of information that's available for people to understand like, mm -hmm. what? how are we making a vaccine? Why is it happening mm -hmm. so quickly? What is even considered safe? Yeah. Um, and I think, under normal circumstances, there's a more funding for education and it's just not happening right now. Mm. Um, yeah, well, it's yeah. probably too fast. People have too much to do to bother trying to educate people. So well, it's hard. hard. And yeah. I think it's interesting as far as vaccine development, like I have been doing some work with CDC Museum um, and they have this exhibit about um, polio. And, you know, that was, I guess in the 60s when, when this happens, like, they made a vaccine and they were like, let's make a million, we got to get it to everyone right now. And so there was one particular batch at one particular lab that wasn't created properly. And so a bunch of kids got polio and some of them died from the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, it's called the Cutter incident. And because of that incident, there's so many regulations and like all these different yeah. things in place. But the lesson learned from that incident is you can't rush these things. Like you have to do it right. Like, you know, and so that's the scary bit I think about right now. There's just so much pressure to do it now. And that's like very unreasonable. I mean, yes, we need it, but you know, you want it to be done right. Um, so at least yeah. now it's not deactivating a virus. Mm. 
versus yeah. then you have like in the pipeline is the actual virus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's yeah, that's a good distinction. Yeah. 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 I think AJC had a really nice um you know, spread on on what was going on. This was maybe a couple months ago about the, the, yeah, the different vaccines that are being developed, um, why it takes as long as it does and, and so on and so forth. But you do have to sort of be proactive. And I think sometimes you, I, I almost feel like we need to have billboards. Sometimes it just, <laughs> it, it needs to, it needs to be come from the other direction fairly mm -hmm. vocally, I guess, because right now it's, it's like you're saying the people that are interested or curious might go and mm -hmm. find this stuff and you'll, you'll definitely find it, but Somehow, I, I feel like the messaging needs to be a bit stronger. I think actually, if I'm recalling correctly, so one of um, our Story Collider producers up in Boston, she is a reporter for the New York Times, and she has been updating a piece, I believe, on New York Times' website of like, these are the different vaccine candidates and like, this is like, pros and yeah, cons or that yeah, status update that. or whatever. So there's at least that, you know, if people want like a quick summary, but um, it would be. You have yeah, to go it, seek it out. It's not, yeah. it's, not, it's not hitting the nightly news or the, you know, or whatever it is yeah. people, or whatever, whatever people read online on a regular basis. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot to take in. There's so many layers of information. Like it's, it's just like, yeah, I'll look at that later. You know? it'll, it'll, <laughs> be here, it'll be here or it won't one way or the other. So. Mm -hmm. This vaccine is also the very first of its kind. Mm. Really? In terms of, yeah. So like normally what you do is you introduce like a piece of the virus, right? Your body is trained to defeat a non-confrontational, non-threatening version. Mm. But this new, this new vaccine, instead of giving you like a piece of the virus, it gives your body the blueprint of the virus and you, your own body makes a small piece of it. It can't do anything on its own. It's like, if you had a car, like it gives you the blueprint for like a hubcap and your body generates antibodies against that one part of the car. And that's how it does. And the thing about it is it's like this really innovative idea that's been in the works for more than 10 years. It's just never made it to clinical trial. And so not only is it targeting this like crazy, you know, pandemic era virus, it's a brand spanking new strategy. Um, so that's are they all, are all the viral strategies going that direction? They're all no. I th I think that's that's just like the the Cadillac of yeah. vaccines that's going through right now. <laughs> um, but there are a variety of different strategies going on right now. Yeah, and it's tricky for different types of viruses. They just have so many different types of characteristics that you have to take. You know, different types of approaches. It gets real complicated real fast. <laughs> Yeah, and Margie's asking how much diversity do you see in the science in the scientific field these days? Man, you're asking a lot of good questions, Margie. <laughs> yeah, she's on it. Margie's she's on, on fire. It. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, and you know, I, I suspect this might vary from department to department. I would say at the moment for us, not enough, but at the same time, it's something that's very much on the department. Uh, mind this this includes of course women this includes people of color it includes a lot of a lot of demographics here and so it's it's something that um, we try to tackle uh, at the graduate level at the faculty level uh, a lot of outreach is done uh, to people uh, at, at the grade school level to to talk about science encourage them and so it's it's, it's something that I think is important and also being addressed uh, pretty actively, at least at Georgia Tech. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, that's the work that I do in a lot of different ways, like trying to engage with people at different levels. So, and like, I don't know, like find different ways to show people examples of themselves. Like, yes, you are a scientist too. Are you curious? Like, did you, you know, like, because I teach preschoolers sometimes and I get them to do, you know, these, these little experiments. And if you're asking questions and you're curious, you're already a scientist. Um, I guess I feel hopeful just because, especially with science Twitter, science Twitter is the best thing in the world. I feel like, I, I just feel like we live in an age where people can kind of speak up together. And I think that I, there was a time when I kind of felt hopeless about academia, just like, wow, all right, you know, like, yes, just these, you know, old white dudes are going to be in charge forever. And that's just what it is. Like, there was just so many things. And I just feel like now 
with science Twitter and like all these different, like, I just feel like there's more accountability and initiatives and things that are, um, that make me feel optimistic and hopeful that we're like really going somewhere with that. When you say science Twitter, you mean science Twitter in general, or is there something specific that science Twitter that none of us know about? <laughs> oh no, I just mean like the science community on Twitter. There's a Got ton it. of scientists, um, really? about, yes, of every kind. Like if you ever find a bug or a bird or a tree or something, and you want to know what it is, send it to science Twitter <laughs> and someone will tell you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll say personally, like so much of it is just like, if you're a young professor, like it's pre pre Twitter, it was hard to get your name out. Huh. Right. And that's where like so much diversity or like the population of diverse scientists are younger scientists. Right. Yeah. So Twitter makes it possible for anyone to become elevated based off the content of the work. So your signal boosting, because I, so when Kelly and I were organizing a conference about science communication, um, <laughs> Kelly actually called me out because I had a panel about virtual reality and she was like, hey girl, like you gotta, you gotta have some representation in, in your area. <laughs> and the thing about it is like, when you Google like virtual reality scientists in Atlanta, how do you, <laughs> how diverse do you think that group of people is? So I just had to put in the work though, like she was right, like there are, it's, and, it, and there are people who are just as high in caliber of work. The thing about it is like when you're famous, other people invite you, right? Mm -hmm. And people invite the same famous people over and over and over mm -hmm. again. So if your name isn't already like on the billboards of the internet, you can't Google them. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the thing where Twitter breaks the internet in that way where like it's no longer the same search algorithms. Everybody is on a much more diverse playing field. Mm -hmm. So when Kelly talks about Twitter bringing up all of the different kinds of people that exist, that's kind of what I think about, but yeah. But I found some badass female and some bra badass brown scientists <laughs> at Virgin Tech after Kelly reminded me that I have to put in the work. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, like people make so it much hard. Positive about social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. And I, I feel like there's just been, again, with account accountability, but I've seen like the former executive director of Story Collider was very strongly kind of, a, you know, if she was invited to be on a panel and everyone else on that panel looked like her, she was like, I'm not doing this. Like you need to, you know, like holding other people accountable. And I feel like that's the type of, I don't know that I feel like that's the direction we're moving in, which I really like because Carlene's totally right. It's just like those same people over and over again. Cause I'm sure that it's people are organizing. It's, yeah. it's, just yeah. that, it's not that people don't like indie rock. It's just that they've been hitting the pop pop music radio stations. <laughs> I love that analogy. That's good. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I don't, I, it, I don't know if it's that way really in the theater world because I don't follow it, but I know that in the uh, film and television world that agents and people that are looking, it's all happened. A lot of that happens on Twitter too. Uh, people find out about new talent and stuff like that. So I, I didn't know that until I started talking to TV people, but that was interesting. So, yeah. Looking for new talent, new, new voices, new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you got to get creative ideas and new energy, you know, that's it's so important. Cool. Well, I think we're, I think we're good. I think we've had a really great discussion. Anyone else have anything else they want to close up with that you all know of? Close us, any closing comments? No. I'm really Last surprised time. that everyone came out on a yeah. Saturday night to hang out. This is so great. I have so much hope for society. And then people <laughs> talk about like how do you deal with the world being anti-science. It's like there, there are at least 19 of us. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, thank you both. You are wonderful panelists. Uh, somebody, uh, and Amy's putting in here that if you want to watch Completeness, um, you've got access. If you um, signed in, you've got access through, um, uh, she's putting in here how you have access to get to the, uh, the whole Completeness to watch it again. Uh, also, if you are watching it on Vimeo, you also have access to closed captions. We hope that it's up for free for at least another week, maybe a little longer. So if you know people that want to see it, please spread the word and tell them. And uh, also we are working on our next uh, project. Very, very different. Nicole is directing and it's going to be a Halloween special. Uh, and it is, uh, well, we're still messing with the title, but it's called The Ghosts of Little Five Points. 
a uh, virtual Halloween mixer for the dead and undead currently. It's title in development. So, uh, but it's going to open in a couple weeks and it will be a live presentation. Uh, so live every night uh, for two weeks in October. So we'll, we'll send out emails and come and see us for that. Uh, finally, if you, uh, besides telling other people, um, Amy's going to drop some stuff in the chat. We thank all of you that may have made a contribution to come tonight. And if you um, would like to make another contribution or would like to contribute, we would love your support. Uh, we are right now uh, existing primarily on contributed income because we are not able to go out and sell tickets to our live stuff. So uh, we hope you encourage you to make a donation to Horizon and also just to come back and see us in the future. All right, so I think that is it. Thank you, Eric, Carleen, Kelly. This is our last one. Oh my gosh, it was really fun. It was a great partnership with Science ATL and I hope to do more. I love plays about yeah. science and there are a whole lot of them out there. So hopefully we have another opportunity and maybe we'll bring this back to go with um, uh, the uh, Science Atlanta, Atlanta Science Festival in March too. Hopefully we'll be able to do another thing like this. Yeah. All right, y'all have a great night. Safe, yeah. be safe. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Yeah, you too.